Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Flynn. I'm Senior Director of uh, Regulatory Relations and Credentialing at CSI. I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar, Financial Professionals Title Protection in Ontario, All You Need to Know. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters. Uh, the standard Moody's disclaimer that any ratings and financial analysis concerning part of the information contained in this webinar must be construed solely as a statement of opinion and not a recommendation to purchase or sell any securities. Today's webinar is being recorded. Um, we ask all the attendees will be on mute. Uh, if you have a question throughout the presentation, please, we encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll be monitoring those questions throughout and we'll um, collate them and ask our uh, panelists those questions um, after the presentation. But we certainly encourage you to ask those questions via the Q&A uh, button. And now on to the webinar. Uh, CSI is very pleased that we were approved last month uh, by the FSRA as a credentialing body and our PFP designation for use as for financial planning titling. Um, so we're very pleased about that and we're grateful to the FSRA team that have come to uh, share with you a little bit about the framework and its implementation um, as it rolls out throughout the year. So I'd like to introduce our panelists from FSRA who will uh, take us through the webinar today. We have uh, Wendy Horvin, Head of Licensing and Risk Assessment. We have Dan Miles, Director of Court Communications. And we have Andrew Foy, who's Senior Manager of FB and FA Policy. So over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues, Wendy and Dan, to speak to you today about the financial planner, financial advisor, or title protection framework. Um, if we could move to the next slide. So just a quick rundown of what we are going to go over for you today. Um, I'll start with some background and some context about the framework. Um, also speaking to um, the value of the framework. So what does this mean for you? Um, Wendy is going to speak to uh, a couple of the key themes that have come up over the last couple of months, uh, transition period being one similar titles as well. Um, Dan is going to speak to our plans for our industry and consumer education campaigns. Uh, and then we will wrap up. And as uh, Mark mentioned, we do have time for questions when we're done. Next slide, please. To the next one. Thank you. The Financial Professionals Title Protection Act was proclaimed into force on March 28, 2022. Uh, the Financial Professionals Title Protection Rule uh, also came into force at the same time. The rule outlines the approval criteria and the minimum standards for the framework. So we are now well underway uh, to implementing the framework. Um, and as you know, uh, the framework will require anyone who wishes to use the financial planner or the financial advisor title in Ontario to have an approved credential from an approved uh, FISBRA approved credentialing body. And at a very high level, uh, the framework establishes minimum educational requirements for uh, the title users, as well as sets out professional expectations with a focus on requiring credential holders to put the client's interests first. And next slide, please. So this slide sets out the different roles and responsibilities under the framework. So the, the who does what essentially. Uh, the left-hand side identifies FISRA's role under the framework. And I think the key element uh, to know here is that the framework gives FISRA limited responsibility with respect to overseeing the conduct of individual title users or credential holders. So our oversight role is with respect to the credentialing bodies. And we do have some enforcement powers in our toolbox. The legislation does give us authority uh, to revoke a credentialing body's approval in the most egregious of cases, as well as to issue compliance orders if for whatever reason we feel that there is some action or a non-compliance um, that we feel we need, we need to, um, to address. Uh, so we do have that ability under the legislation. We also have authority uh, under the Act to issue compliance orders against individuals who are using either of the titles but without an approved credential. Uh, and that really is the extent of our engagement with individuals under the framework. So only those who are using the, the titles without an approved credential. 
On the right hand side uh, lists the or identifies the uh, roles for the approved credentialing bodies under the framework. And so credentialing bodies will be granting or issuing the approved credentials to, uh, to their uh, credential holders. They'll also be overseeing the conduct of the credential holders. And so, as you know, um, credential holders are required to abide by a code of conduct um, that is set up by the credentialing body and that the credentialing body can also impose discipline uh, where and when that may be necessary. And so one additional item that I wanted to just mention here that isn't articulated on this slide is about fees. Uh, so FISRU does have authority to collect fees from credentialing bodies. And those fees will enable us to recover our costs for implementing the framework, as well as our ongoing regulatory oversight. And we have built in flexibility into our rule that allows the credentialing bodies to determine um, the most appropriate way for them to recoup any costs that they may incur for participation under the framework. And so FISRA will not be collecting fees directly from credential holders, uh, instead from the credentialing bodies. If we could move to the next slide. Sorry. Great, thank you. Uh, so over the last couple of months, we have announced the approved credentialing bodies and credentials uh, under the framework. Um, we have approved four credentialing bodies so far, CSI, uh, as one of them with the personal financial planner designation approved for financial planner title use, which means anyone who holds that designation uh, is permitted to use the financial planner title uh, while conducting, conducting business with consumers or investors or holding yourself out. Um, we've also approved three others, FP Canada, uh, the Institute of, of Advanced Financial Education, which is a division of advocates, as well as the Canadian Institute of Financial Planning with various uh, different credentials under those three. Uh, we, we expect this list to, uh, to grow and uh, we do have this information available on our website and we will update that list uh, as uh, additional credentialing bodies and credentials are approved. If we could move to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about value. So what is the value of the framework? Prior to implementation of the framework, the issue was that there really were no regulatory requirements with respect to title use in Ontario. Uh, there also were no regulatory standards uh, in connection with anyone who wanted to hold themselves out as a, a financial planner or a financial advisor. Um, and so this led to questions about proficiency uh, of these individuals, and it was something that did need to be addressed. And, and I will say that during our consultation period or our design phase, um, there was overwhelming support and recognition for title protection in Ontario and that this was an area that needed to be addressed and action did need to be taken. We also did some consumer research at the end of 2020 um, and the majority of consumers that we surveyed uh, were in agreement that uh, the financial planner and financial advisor titles uh, should be regulated in Ontario. So the framework will see that every individual who holds themselves out as a financial planner or financial advisor will need to have a minimum standard of education. They will need to be actively supervised by a credentialing body and need to be subject to a complaints and a discipline process. And so the framework in terms of value to consumers, this is gonna increase the level of confidence that consumers have in individuals who use those titles because they will know that they need to meet those minimum requirements. Under the framework, uh, credential holders are also going to be required to disclose their credential to consumers or investors. Um, and so this is just an additional level of clarity uh, so that if there was an issue, if there is a complaint that consumers do know that they can go to the credentialing body to, to have those rectified. And right now there is a wide array of different titles and different designations being used in the marketplace. So title protection is also going to reduce confusion for consumers um, as they come to understand the value associated with, with uh, the use of both titles. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for industry? What does this mean for you as a PFP designation holder? So officially being able to use the financial planner title or the financial advisor title for those who have an approved FA credential it'll make it easier for you to communicate your value to consumers. And so when you establish a minimum standard, whether it's for education or conduct or through the supervision, 
We're promoting consistency, it's promoting professionalism in the marketplace, and it's increasing confidence among consumers for those individuals who use the title. It's also going to increase credibility. And so those minimum standards and the supervision standards, that's gonna help weed out the bad actors um, and those individuals who may not be serving consumers or investors as they should be. Uh, credentialing bodies are also going to have to share information with each other uh, under the framework, specifically with respect to discipline and enforcement proceedings. So we want to make sure that inadequate performance by a credential holder is widely known amongst uh, the approved credentialing bodies. And so this will have benefit to industry as well as consumers and will also help weed out those, those bad actors. I also wanted to mention here too, um, so in addition to each credentialing body having to have their own registry of credential holders on their website, FISRA is also going to be developing its own registry. It'll be more of a one-stop shop for consumers. Uh, so when consumers are working with an individual, they will be able to search in their name and verify whether they have an approved credential. So that's something that uh, we're in the planning stages and hopefully we expect that to be up and running for next year. And Atika, if we could go to the next slide, great. And so one additional uh, item from me in terms of value, uh, we wanted to talk about national harmonization. So confusion around title use and around minimum standards is not a unique, uh, is not unique to Ontario. Um, as you probably know, there are rules in Quebec already for uh, individuals who want to uh, be financial planners or use the financial planner title. Um, the framework that we've implemented in Ontario is a framework that can be adopted nationally and potentially benefit consumers across, across the country. So there are a number of other jurisdictions, Saskatchewan, for example, New Brunswick um, as another that are adopting or are in the process of working on legislation to adopt similar frameworks. We are working with them. We are consulting with them um, to discuss opportunities to harmonize the frameworks. And we see this as a significant benefit for our credentialing bodies if we can aim to harmonize compliance standards as well as even create efficiencies with respect to the application process. And so I am going to hand it over to Wendy. Thank you very much, Andrea, and uh, thank you again for having us uh, today to present to you on title protection. Um, actually, if you want to move the slides ahead to the next one, we'll dive right in. My next few slides are, are really some key points that you will want to know about uh, title usage. The first being clients' interests first. Understanding the client's needs and goals and, and prioritizing them is the most valued aspect of financial planning and advisory services. The title protection rule requires that an individual deal with clients competently, professionally, fairly, honestly, and in good faith. FISR approves applications for credentialing bodies in this regard by requiring a code of conduct that puts clients' interests first as well as obviously many other aspects of your codes of conduct. Um, and as well, uh, we're looking to see that practice standards also include this component. So as we move forward, FISRA, and, and in fact, we're developing our supervisory plan now, we'll be conducting reviews of credentialing bodies processes in the future, and included will certainly be top of mind for us, uh, seeing how they monitor how advisors and planners put clients' best interests first. Um, we can move to the next slide. And one more, thank you. Uh, next, I'll, I will uh, touch on transition period. So the financial planner and advisor title protection framework will be phased in over time. In the early stages and for the remainder of 2022, we will be focusing on continuing to approve credentialing bodies and assisting them with implementing this regime. FISRA's enforcement activities against non-compliant title users will focus on resp responding to consumer complaints and protecting consumers from harm by requesting that non-compliant title users voluntarily cease using the title within 30 days. FISRA will continue to work with interested parties wishing to seek approval uh, as credentialing bodies, as I mentioned, and if 
uh, you would like to know more about the application process, uh, in the slide here, there's a reference to our guidance, which uh, lays out that process. So for those of you who were using the financial planner and advisor titles prior to this regime, and in fact, on or before January 1st, 2020, the transition period is as follows, four years for financial planners and two years for advisors. We can move ahead. Thank you. So it is uh, each title user's obligation to monitor whether they are part of a designation granting or licensing body that has been approved um, as a credentialing body. And uh, it was earlier uh, in the presentation that uh, Andrea uh, had a list of those who have been approved, but also you can go to the FISRA website and you'll, you will see those approvals there on the website and can be kept up to date. Um, it's also the title user's obligation if they do not have the right of title use as a result of a current designation or license to take steps before the end of the transition period to become credentialed by an approved, we'll call them CD, that's the acronym we use, failure, failure to do so will result in the loss of the right to use a protected title and possibly lead to sanctions. Those who started to use the title after that January 1st, 2020 date are only permitted to use these titles once they hold a FISRA approved designation or license that grants the title use. They will have to obtain the appropriate credentials in order to use the title. Our current implement, implementation approach leverages existing frameworks for licensing and designating financial professionals. We can move ahead. Similar titles to FA and FP. So under sections two and three of the act, um, there uh, is information there about the use of financial planner and financial advisor titles in another language, an abbreviation, or a title that could be reasonably confused with financial planner and financial advisor titles. Um, as well, there's another link here to our supervision guidance, which outlines, and much like the chart that you see here, illustrative examples of titles that could be reasonably confused. So we will look at these on a case-by-case -case basis um, that are brought to us by concerns or complaints um, uh, regarding title usage. So here's just some examples. So a variation in spelling or abbreviation and an example could be financial advisor with an E, spelled with an E rather than an O, or the classic acronyms FPFA. Also, a title using financial planner or planning in combination with another term, such as financial wealth planner, financial planning advisor, and finally, a title using financial advisor advising in combination with another term, senior financial advisor, financial advising coach. And I'm sure there are many others, <laughs> but we can uh, move ahead. Oh, and actually with that, I'll uh, pass off to my colleague, Dan Miles. Great, thanks, Wendy. And uh, thank you uh, for having us again uh, today. Um, with respect to uh, the communications campaigns, um, as the um, credentialing bodies have been approved, um, we've been reaching out and working directly with the communications teams of each of those uh, organizations um, and um, working on identifying uh, available communications channels and, and the most appropriate ways to reach out to um, to the uh, members and um, uh, the existing uh, financial um, financial services professionals. So we're currently uh, in the midst of doing that and um, <clears throat> and uh, developing um, um, uh, toolkits and developing other communications products that we can, that we can share and ensure that we have um, um, common um, messages and that um, and that we're all singing from the same songbook. Um, with respect to um, the um, balance of the fiscal year. Um, we've mapped out um, campaigns, um, both uh, from a, an earned media, so generating uh, media coverage around um, the 
developments that, that are happening on this file, um, as well as a, a paid advertising campaign um, that we'll be launching. So uh, with respect to um, the industry side, um, we're going to be targeting um, the industry um, early in the fall in, uh, in September. Uh, we'll have a modest campaign uh, that will both uh, be a combination of earned and paid um, media um, and social media as well. Um, and then um, we'll launch right into um, a consumer campaign that would um, um, leverage financial uh, literacy month and um, financial planning week and um, and try and drive some earned media around there, but also um, having a, a robust um, uh, paid advertising campaign, primarily on, on the social and search side. Um, and then um, in um, um, mid-January to February, um, leading into tax season, we'll also again be uh, promoting um, the this initiative on the industry side. Um, so um, I, again, um, we're working directly with the credentialing bodies and their teams. Um, and, um, you know, if anyone has any um, uh, suggestions on how, how best to reach um, some, of, uh, some of the financial services professionals, um, I'd be more than happy to uh, take your suggestions. So with that, I'll pass it on to Andrea. Thanks, Dan. If we can just move to the next one more. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so just to, to recap, I believe we've touched on these points already, um, but we are actively reviewing applications for credentialing bodies and we will be posting on our website and publicly announcing should we uh, approve any additional credentialing bodies and credentials over the coming months. Uh, we will be working again on the public registry, um, identifying all of the individuals who hold approved credentials in Ontario. And in terms of communications, uh, we have set up regular touch points with uh, the approved credentialing bodies to discuss our tactics and, uh, and planning for, for both the industry and the consumer education campaign. And this is something that will be ongoing over, over the next year. And so Mark, I think we can move into the Q&A. All right, we have some questions. Uh, so let's keep coming them in. That's good now that we've covered the presentation. If there's some things you want clarifications on, um, just add them to the Q&A. Um, one of the first questions that came up was, um, who regulates lawyers and mediators giving financial advice to couples going through a divorce? Uh, so, I mean, I believe lawyers have their own uh, their own oversight body. I'm not sure about mediators, um, but our um, uh, framework only deals with individuals who use the financial planner or the financial advisor title. So it's only use of title. It doesn't have to do with activity. So even if there is a lawyer or a mediator who happens to be giving financial advice, as long as they are not holding themselves out as a financial advisor or planner, then the framework would not apply to, to their activities. Okay. Um, so one of the, the uh, one of the, we talked about sort of similar titles, um, I think Wendy touched on that. Um, for example, something like financial consultant, uh, would that be seen as an acceptable title uh, or not in contradiction if somebody didn't have a, a credential? So short answer to that one, financial consultant would likely not be captured. Um, so I know the slide deck um, has, has some examples as well as our guidance, but sort of like the quick and dirty rule is if you're using financial and planner or financial and advisor in combination with any other word, that title would likely be captured under the framework. Okay, good. Um, th there's a few questions relating to the transition period. Um, uh, one of them was about uh, insurance. It's, it's financial advisors used a lot to buy insurance or uh, insurance licensees. Um, can they continue to use that, the term financial advisor during this transition period? Okay, um, so I mean, regardless of what kind of license someone has, um, if they qualify for the transition period, then they can continue to use either the financial planner title for four years or financial advisor title for two years. 
if that transition period happens to not apply to them, um, then, I mean, we understand, as Wendy mentioned, we understand it's going to take time for individuals to, you know, to sort of switch up their business model, um, change their uh, marketing materials. Um, so um, we do understand that. And so we'll be looking at these on a case by case basis, should um, a complaint come in about individuals um, using a title when they may, uh, may or when they shouldn't be. Um, but I mean, otherwise, uh, the transition period should should um, should cover many of the individuals who are already using the title. Okay. And, and if somebody is working, it's a little bit an, ex, an extension of that question is if somebody is working towards a designation today, could they put something like FA candidate or something like that while they get to that designation? So use of something like a financial advisor candidate as a title would fall into the, the similar title of the reasonably confusing. So unless that transition period does apply, um, then that title shouldn't, shouldn't be used, even if, if, even if you are um, on the way to, to obtaining an approved credential. There's a few questions specifically about certain specific titles. One of them is, if somebody has a QAFP today, uh, can they use the financial planner uh, title while they work towards their CFP? Uh, QAFP has been approved. Um, and so that it is approved for financial planner title use, so yes. Right, okay. And then some specifically to CSI, so there's questions about the CIM and FCSI, uh, if people have those titles, if they can use FA or FP and um, at this time, no. Um, right now, the, the only credential we have submitted to FSRA is the um, PFP designation um, for the use of financial planner, but we have uh, no other, at this point, we have not submitted any other credentials uh, for the use of that title for now. Uh, another question there was about um, other than Saskatchewan and Ontario, are there any other provinces that are looking into this um, reform or some type of reform? So as far as our intel, nothing concrete. Um, there are, you know, there are discussions with other provinces, but Saskatchewan and, and New Brunswick are the only two provinces that actually are, are moving forward with, with a plan. Okay. Um, the, one of the questions here is, do these rules apply to banks? Uh, so the framework applies to any individual, uh, regardless of whether you work for a bank, an insurance company, if you have your own your own business, if you use either of the titles, then the framework applies to you. Okay, that's pretty clear. Um, can you just, there's another question regarding the transition. So it went the two years and the four years, two years for FA to four years for FP begins on what date? It began as of March 28th, 2022, when the legislation was proclaimed. Okay. Um, this, okay, there's a few questions here. Um, uh, well, here, I'll just, I'll just read it out. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no point. Uh, um, it's a very direct question. So uh, the FSRA seems to have some bark, but does not have some bite. I'm assuming it's about your ability to sanction uh, advisors um, directly. Um, so we could maybe comment on that. Sure. Uh, so any individual that holds an approved credential, so it is the responsibility of the credentialing bodies. Um, they, they could not get approved without a complaints process, without a discipline process, without, without having some kind of sanction uh, for non-compliance with respect to the code of conduct. Uh, so FISRA is removed from, from um, enforcement action with respect to those individuals. Um, but as I mentioned, we do have authority to take enforcement action, so to issue compliance orders for individuals who don't fall under a credentialing body, who may be using one of the titles and they don't actually have an approved credential. All right, thanks, Andrea. Uh, one of the questions here is uh, if you reside outside of Ontario but have clients in Ontario, are you subject to FSRA rules? Uh, so, I mean, subject to the framework in general, um, as in having to have an approved credential. Um, even if you live outside of, uh, even if you live outside of Ontario, if you're using one of those titles 
to do business in Ontario, then the framework captures you. Okay. Okay, so again, a lot of these tend to, to circulate around the sort of transition rules. Um, so I think, I think it might be worth just uh, you, you mentioned the transition from if somebody has been using about the issue of when they started using the financial advisor, which is the January 1st, 2020 date, and then it kicks from March 28, 22. So it might be just worth going through that sequencing again. Uh, I think there's been a lot of questions around that. Sure. So there's, I guess there's two tests. So were you using the financial advisor or planner title before January 1st, 2020? If yes, then the transition applies to you. And so if the transition applies, you have two years from March 28th, 2022, or four years, if it's for a financial planner, uh, to continue to use the title uh, while you obtain uh, uh, an approved credential. And so if somebody was not using, had not you know, just started an industry in, you know, last year, a year ago, um, and was using the term financial advisor because it wasn't regulated or even financial planner, um, what is the, what, what rule, what, how do they fall in like right now? Are they offside as of now? Yeah. So in, individuals who were not using it before that January 20, January 1st, 2020 date should not be using the title uh, right now. Um, but, and, and again, we can, I'll stress this again. Uh, uh, we're not taking proactive enforcement action right now. We do understand it's going to take time for, for individuals to change up their, uh, the way that they do business uh, in order to accommodate for the framework. Okay. Um, one of the questions, I guess, it's, it's for us, it's, it's uh, the, the CSI. Somebody has a PFP designation, can they use it nationally? The answer is yes, except for Quebec. Um, so the use of, in the other provinces, is uh, the, the use of the title usage is not regulated, other than now Ontario and in the past, Quebec. The say Saskatchewan and New Brunswick are, are looking at that type of regulation. So that might come in the future. But right now, uh, there's no restrictions in the other jurisdictions as far as using that those titles. Um, let's see here. Uh, there's some requests here to the, our, this, temp, this webinar is being taped. So it will be available to our designation holders. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, is this, um, Andrew or Wendy, if, if this presentation is available uh, to participants uh, of the seminar. Sure, yeah, of course. Okay, so we will, um, we will um, I'll, at the end, I'll do the housekeeping regarding how you can get that, but we will have access, make this accessible to, uh, to all of you, the presentation. Um, so one, another question here as they come in. Um, so for the financial advisor title, uh, or usage, uh, what are the qualifications that are presently approved? Uh, the yeah. Credentials, maybe? The, the credentials. credentials, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, right now, so we have, um, we have the PFA, so the Professional Financial Advisor credential, um, that is an advocate's credential. And we have two additional ones that are approved for the Canadian Institute of Financial Planning. It is the registered financial and retirement advisor credential, as well as the registered retirement analyst credential. So those are outlined in the deck and they're also on our website. Okay. So let's see if there's any more questions, don't, don't be shy. Uh, if there's some additional questions, we have all the right people here on, on, the, on our panel to ask on uh, uh, other questions do you have. Okay. One question, does, are there any C credits for this session? Uh, no, there aren't. That's an easy one. Other notes here. Okay. 
Right. Okay, I guess one question, oh, this, this was gonna come up eventually. Um, uh, is how much is the fee and <clears throat> how will it apply? I'll, I'll let FSRI answer first and then, then I can answer for the CSI side. Sure. Um, so uh, with respect to fees on the FISRA side, so FISRA has authority to collect from credentialing bodies, not from individual credential holders. So uh, the fee that we uh, charge will be directly to CSI. And we have built in flexibility into the fee rules so that it really is, it's up to CSI how they want to determine um, how, how, how much they charge and, and how they're going to, to, to recoup that, that cost from credential holders. Mark. All right, then I guess it's back to me now, I guess. Eh? Uh, thanks, Andrew. So um, we haven't finalized this. The numbers, uh, it, a lot of this, uh, the, the fees that are, are being determined by really how many advisors or how many planners or advisors are part of the pool covering this framework, and that is being finalized now, uh, since it depends how many credentialing body and credentials are, are covered. But the estimate we've been provided is that the additional fee uh, it'd be around $65 uh, for Ontario residents or those active in Ontario. So that's something we will finalize likely in the next month and we will communicate that to all our PFP holders who are on, you know, um, in, the, in the coming uh, few weeks and we'll figure out how we will do that. But that's the, the uh, incremental fee expected to be for uh, those active and resident of Ontario. Uh, that would be above and beyond the existing fee. So details about that are coming for PFPs uh, in the next uh, six weeks. Um, I'm looking here. Um, sorry, this few came, few just came in. Uh, so our firm is using senior financial planner title and has been using that before January 1st, 2020. Can we continue to use senior financial planner? Do we have to drop the senior? If, if the transition period applies to you, you can continue um, using senior financial planner, keeping in mind that once that transition period is over, you do have to hold an approved credential to continue to do so, to use it. Okay. Uh, I guess there's a question here about grandfathering. Um, I, I guess I'll let you answer that. I mean, you've talked about transition rules, but are there any grandfathering possibilities, if you want to call it that? So the framework does not um, have a grand have grandfathering criteria. It's just strictly the, the transition period. Okay. Another interesting question again, you focus here on the advisors or the planners themselves as individuals. Um, how does this still apply to a firm? As long as there's one financial planner, can a firm market itself as a financial planning firm in its name? So the framework doesn't specifically apply to firms, so it's only for individuals. Uh, so regardless, regardless of where you're working, if you want to use one of the two titles, you have to have an approved credential. Um, I mean, I guess so essentially any firms need to make sure that their policies and procedures with respect to title use within that firm comply um, with the title protection framework. Um, and, and just to, I guess, speak to a nuance. So I mentioned earlier, this framework is only with, re with respect to use of the title, not activity. So if somebody could you know, say that they offer financial planning services, as long as they're not using the title, they can continue to do that. Great, thank you. Um, so another question related to, you know, to, to new, new person in the industry that is seeking an approved designation. The question is, does FSRA have a proposed title? Oh, would, would we have an example of something that you could use as you're seeking a credential? Um, no, um, I mean you can you can use any title that you like as long as it not as long as it doesn't fall into that similar title category uh, while you're working toward a designation. Yeah, and I think looking at this question right now, I think the other thing is there right now FSRA has accredited credentialing bodies that have multiple credentials available, some for FA, some for FP. So I think the idea is that, that, that a new advisor or a new person who wants to use that title in Ontario has, enough, has different credentialing bodies, uh, organizations it can go to 
uh, that have been accredited and those and there may be more that will be coming on stream in the coming months as well. And that's all available on the FSRA site and it was on this slide deck as well. I think that's part of where that um, was coming from. Um, have you decided what will, this is, I guess, for Dan, uh, have you decided what will be communicated in the fall to consumers? Have we decided, um, essentially, um, um, with respect to, um, to consumers, um, we're gonna be talking about the advantages of, um, obviously, the initiative um, for them um, on, um, you know, on uh, what, um, articulating what what Andrea went through in the slide um, but um, I think also um, you know um, we'll be working with the credentialing bodies um, to um, talk about um, you know um, uh, how they're operating and um, and um, you know how to um, uh, to to locate um, members and so on and so forth so I, I think that um, you know, um, we'll be driving people to the website, um, to to the credentialing body websites, to our websites. We'll have them linked, and, and we'll try and um, uh, you know our, uh, create a broad awareness about the initiative um, out there in the public, uh, as broad as, as possible, um, so people know what to look like, uh, look know what to look for, know what questions to ask, um, and um, and and those sorts of things. And I think I can add in one of the, I mean, some of the requirements that FSRA, um, you know, required of the credentialing bodies was to, um, you know, to sort of make it very visible who are the, the you know, as Dan alluded to, um, who are they, the advisors that, the, that, are, that met the qualifications, which ones are still in good standing because all the designations, you know, people have to renew on an annual basis, such as PFPs today. Again, this doesn't change for PFPs is something we're doing anyway. Um, but now it's a question of making that available on our website, very clear to consumers who you're looking for, um, you know, the registry. And um, I think Wendy or Andrea addressed the fact that um, there, there's a desire to sort of create a broader public re registry, which would, uh, regardless of which credentialing body somebody was part of, they would um, be in that registry. Um, and even things like consumer complaints, you know, there was, you know, we've enhanced our you know, uh, make it clearer for, for uh, com consumers to complain and so on if they have any issues with our designation holders. So I think those are all, as Dan pointed out, a lot of this is, is, is you know, is the FSRA making it visible, but also working, um, driving people to those credentialing bodies that, that will have a lot more information on, you know, what are the education requirements of, of FAs or FPs and what, what's the difference between the two of them and which ones might be more appropriate depending on what your needs are and, and that kind of stuff. Um, there's some questions here, which is, um, can I, okay, this is one, uh, can I use the titles interchangeably, example, using FA title if you only hold a credential that is approved for FP? So, no, um, you can only use the title if you have an approved, uh, if only use the title that the credential has been approved for. So the PFP has been approved for financial planner title use. So you cannot use the financial advisor title unless you have maybe an additional designation that's been approved for FA title use. So similar to that, I mean, so there's some questions here from, which is not surprising, it's the CSI designation community that, that's been invited to this uh, webinar about, you know, CSI's other uh, potential looking at other uh, of credentialing or seeking credentialing uh, approval for, for other CSI designations. Uh, we are looking into that. So one of the questions here was the CIM, for example. Um, but at this time, the only credential that we have submitted the FSRA is the PFP um, for the use of, for, for somebody who want to use financial planning title in, in Ontario. Um, and we are exploring other opportunities. But uh, I, I think one of the issues here is, is you know, do, you know, we, you know, the PFP qualified for a financial planning title because it covered topics and the body of knowledge that was covered there was, was um, covered the, the, the minimum competencies that FSRA put out for, for a financial planner. And they've done the same thing for an FA. So I think some of the questions are being asked here, if somebody has the FCSI, if somebody's the CIM, they have lots of education and knowledge in, in, a, in several areas, but may not be related to financial planning. So what might be deemed by some as a 
you know, as a legitimate and a recognized designation by IROC, for example, um, that doesn't mean that they would automatically qualify or they, it, they do not automatically qualify to the FSRA based on the requirements that FSRA has set. There is a, you know, sort of a, a body of knowledge or a competency or a skill set that has been articulated in the rule and the regulations related to what, it, what is financial advice and then what is financial planning. And, and therefore, uh, that's what the credentialing bodies have been uh, targeting. So, um, again, I think it's, it, it, it's you know, the, 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 the other CSI designations and others in the marketplace may be extremely valuable and recognized by other regulators, but they may not fit um, uh, the box if you want uh, the, the FSRA is set for the use of those uh, titles. But it is something we are looking at. We are talking to our, um, our clients and, and to our designation holders to see if, um, there may be some movement there that we can do to try and address some of the concerns that have been brought up here and, and in other discussions we've had. I think I've covered the questions that have come up. Any other last questions, last chance, anybody? We have a couple minutes left. And, and Mark, I was just going to add on that last point that um, uh, we, uh, as I mentioned in in the slides that I covered, we provided a couple of links there. So if anyone is still sort of just, eh, you know, I'm not really kind of understanding the concept, um, they can certainly go and do a deep dive into the approved minimum criteria uh, and the differences between the FA criteria versus FP. And, um, and, and now that uh, you also know and can go to a resource of uh, all of the various approved um, credentials, the, you know, if you're struggling with it, I think that will help shed some light on, you know, why these credentials uh, for this particular title versus not, um, you know, based on your own situation. I'm, I'm sure other people have, um, are wondering about certain nuances of why we've done what we've done. And that would certainly help further your understanding. Not that it's riveting reading, but you know, for those of you out there who <laughs> want to do a deep dive, it's certainly there. Oh, there's lots of stuff there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think we've covered all the questions. Um, and uh, thank you, Wendy, Dan, and Andrea for for participating and um, answering those response those questions so directly. So that's that's great. Um, I think if there's any additional questions that you can, again, I think as Wendy pointed out, there'll be, there's lots of stuff on the FSRA website. There we go uh, on this and, and the whole reform with the, what was, it, you know, but then also the nuts and bolts of what an FA is or an FFP is and, and what a credentialing body does and doesn't do. Um, so, uh, but if you have any questions, go there or any questions to CSI relating to the CSI designations, those designations at csi.ca. You can send us an email there with any questions. This webinar will, was recorded as mentioned and will be um, posted on our CSI website uh, in the next few days uh, for, and it's accessible to all designation holders. Um, and we will indicate there um, where you can get the, um, the, the presentation available to you, unless Nitika, you have a clarification of where to find uh, once we post this. Uh, Nitika, maybe you can jump in. Yes, definitely. Uh, if you want to access the webinar replay and slides, it will be available on the CSI website. The URL for that is csi.ca slash resources. Um, it will be available early next week. Um, we will also be sending an email out to all registrants uh, with the link to access the slides and the recordings. So um, watch out your inbox for that. All right, so that's good. Nitika's uh, way ahead of me on this, so I should have asked her before. Um, so thank you again, Wendy, Dan, and Andrea. Thank you for all the, the attendees that spent some time with us this, this month or uh, today. Um, I think it's an important um, uh, important change for the industry, and it is something for those of you who may not be in Ontario that that is rippling, um, being looked at in, in other provinces, some specifically in New Brunswick, New Saskatchewan, but I think others are watching to see how this evolves, and um, 
I think everybody agrees that some kind of harmonization across Canada is important for firms and advisors. So um, it'll be interesting to see where the other provinces take this. So thank you again for your time and uh, look forward to the next webinar. Thank you, everybody.